Good evening, welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines. Thousands of jobs safe in Portsmouth as BAE is awarded a multi-million pound naval contract. Calling time on the tax disc. You still need to pay, but don't need to display. But what does it mean for one collector's hobby? Snake on a flame. Look what one family found hiding in their boiler. And... Look, I see it. It's all no go. A film favourite. One of the stars of the railway children gets a brush-up. Good evening to you. Thousands of jobs have been secured in Portsmouth. BAE Systems has been awarded a multi-million pound contract by the Ministry of Defence to repair and maintain half of the Navy's surface fleet and manage the naval base. It's a real boost to the city after the decision to move naval shipbuilding to Scotland, meaning the closure of BAE's Portsmouth shipyard and the loss of 900 jobs. Well, the new contract will run for five years until 2019. It'll be worth £600 million, meaning security for more than 2,000 employees. Richard Jones sends this from Portsmouth. It's just a few weeks since shipbuilding in Portsmouth ended, with the last piece of the carrier HMS Prince of Wales leaving the city bound for Scotland. Hundreds of workers lost their jobs, so today's announcement comes as a huge relief for the 2,000 BAE employees who remain in the naval base supporting the fleet. It's great for me because I know my apprenticeship, after my finishing my apprenticeship, I'm going to be able to go out in the yard and get a job for another couple of years. So it's really reassuring for me. We've got a lot of time extra to sort of think about that we've actually got a job and it's going to be secured for the next couple of years, which means that, again, that, you know, we're definitely secured in what we've got. There aren't any new jobs with this announcement and BAE will effectively carry on doing the work it's already done for more than a decade. But a long-term contract means security. It means you can make longer term investment decisions with the MOD, having the certainty of, of, of that enduring contract period. So, and yes, for, for individuals here on the base who are currently on short term contracts because of um, continued extensions, now we're, we're able to provide that long term certainty. So it does make quite a difference. Today's announcement is obviously very good news, and that's been in short supply here for the last few years. But realistically, was there any alternative? Could the work done here have gone anywhere else? We do need to realise that there is more than one naval base in the UK. Plymouth has a substantial uh, presence as well, albeit in the uh, submarine industry. But actually, you know, it really wasn't a done deal that these jobs were going to remain definitely in Portsmouth. We've had a look at that in the previous uh, Strategic Defence Review. Uh, for this uh, commitment, we've looked at both yards individually. We've, we've got yards down in, uh, as you know, in the southwest. We've got a yard in, uh, in, in Scotland and we have a naval base here in Portsmouth. Uh, we've had a look at that and uh, we've actually uh, proceeded with our uh, single source negotiations with British Air, uh, with BAE. Uh, they've been very successful, I think it's an excellent deal. And of course there's the timing. I'm assured that announcing the good news today, the last day of the Conservative Party conference, was entirely coincidental. Richard Jones, ITV News, Portsmouth. Well, as Richard said there, the news came at the end of the Tory party conference in Birmingham, where the day was dominated by the Prime Minister's speech. Our political correspondent Phil Hornby is also there and sends this report. It was a day of big announcements and big promises, with the election just over seven months away and with Portsmouth a key election battleground, the timing politically couldn't have been better. And it came from the former Minister for Portsmouth. Today I'm announcing a £3.3 billion investment in our naval bases, securing 7,500 jobs in Portsmouth, in Devonport and on the Clyde. I obviously still want to see more done on shipbuilding and we're still working on that with the, the companies, the commercial co companies, non-defence, that want to come in and build ships in the yard. That's very important. Hopefully more announcements on that later. Um, but today this is fantastic and it is setting Portsmouth up to be the home of the surface fleet and the, the centre of excellence for logistics and maintenance. The main event, an unusually passionate and emotional speech from David Cameron. Listen to him talk about what he calls Labour lies about the Tories and the NHS. For me, 
This is personal. I'm someone who has relied on the NHS and whose family knows more than most just how important it is. Who knows what it's like when you go to hospital night after night with a sick child in your arms, knowing that when you get there, there were people who will love that child and care for that child just as like it was their own. And how dare they suggest I would ever put that at risk for other people's children. How dare they frighten those who rely on a national health service. NHS budgets would be protected, he said, but there would be other spending cuts under a future Tory government. Income tax cuts too, including a plan to raise the 40p tax threshold from £42,000 to £50,000, a tax cut for Middle England. He realises that you know, the country is sleepwalking towards Ed Miliband in number 10. Imagine. You know, and he was actually setting out the choice. That's what this conference has been all about. It's about the choice between David Cameron and the Conservatives in number 10 or a Labour government. The longest general election campaign we've ever known is now underway. Phil Hornby, ITV News, Birmingham. More news from around the region now. And a construction worker who fell from a stately home in Brighton is in hospital with serious head injuries. Emergency crews were called to Stanmer House yesterday. It's thought he fell between 15 and 20 feet. Midwives in the region will be joining others across the country in strike action next month in a dispute over pay. 82% of the Royal College of Midwives members back the walkouts. The RCM says it's meeting with employers to ensure mothers and babies are not put at risk during the industrial action. Five people questioned over the discovery of hundreds of weapons in a pond in West Sussex have been released on bail. More than 800 items, including handguns, machetes and knives, were found at White Bean Woods in Durrington in July. And overturned lorries caused major delays on the A34 all day and things won't be improving for Russia. Louise Lewis is in our newsroom for us now. Louise, tell us what's been going on today. Yes, Fred, the A34 northbound at Sutton Scotney remains closed this evening. The lorry overturned just after 7 o'clock this morning after it was involved in a collision with a car. The driver of the lorry was airlifted to hospital with serious injuries. The car, a Skoda Octavia, ended up in a ditch, although it's not yet clear whether the driver suffered any injuries. 11 hours on and still in place is a diversion for drivers via Bullington Cross, but the road is congested because of the high amount of traffic using the route. Please, thank you very much indeed. And you can find the very latest on the A34 crash and the delays and diversions on our website. You can scan the square using a smartphone or just go to itv.com forward slash news forward slash Meridian. We'll update with the latest throughout the evening. Well, in football, Brighton picked up a point last night thanks to the birthday boy, Bruno. The Spanish right back opened the scoring against Cardiff and is today celebrating his 34th birthday. Happy birthday, Bruno. But despite the Seagulls having the best of the play, the Welsh side equalised through former Southampton striker Kenwyn Jones. It was a disappointing night for Bournemouth. First, they saw goalkeeper Lee Camp sent off for handling outside the area. Then, with 10 minutes to go, Derby took the lead through Will Hughes. To make matters worse, in stoppage time, the Cherries conceded again, leaving them six points off the playoff places. Well, you're watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Thanks for choosing us. As ever, coming up, the latest weather picture. Are things going to cool down? Now we're in October. Plus, a history lesson through hairstyles. Celebrations in Southampton at the start of Black History Month. And what a collection. On the day we say goodbye to the paper tax disc, why this young boy is keeping all of his. Well, for more on all of our stories, head to uh, itv.com forward slash news forward slash Meridian. Any views or news, please call us. Here's the number 0808 10 10 095. Or you can get in touch via Facebook. Or if you prefer, why not send us a tweet at ITV Meridian. The ITV News continues with the national and international news at 6.30. Here's Alistair Stewart. Tax cuts for 30 million, says Cameron, if he wins the general election. The Tory conference loved it, but Labour say it's uncosted pie in the sky. We put the promise to the test.
A body is found in the Alice Gross investigation. Police say it's now a murder inquiry, with the main suspect still missing. Join Mary Nightingale and me at 6.30. Thank you very much indeed. Now, they've been a familiar sight on our windscreens, of course, for more than 93 years. But today, it's the end of an era for the tax disc. From now on, everything will be done digitally, using an electronic register to keep records. Yes, the government says it'll save money, but some motoring organisations say it could make fraud easier. Either way, those little perforated circles of paper will be missed by many. Andrea Thomas reports. It's a bit of a sad day for Jude Curry today. He loves tax discs. He's got 12,000 of them, actually. It all started off in April 2009. I was on the internet, and there was this abandoned Fiat, and it had a tax disc in the window, and I thought, that's an interesting t thing to collect. So the next morning, we went to the scrapyard, and I got about 20 or 30 tax discs, and it started all from then. Andrew Shepherd is also feeling slightly emotional. He's got some of the earliest square discs that you had to cut out yourself. They kept going at that format until 1938 and they started putting perforations on them. That went on to 1942 and fortunately the factory got bombed during the war. So they went back to the old style of cutting them out and it wasn't until 1952 we started doing perforations on them again. Motorists have always had a bit of a love-hate relationship with the tax disc. Rather fond of that flimsy bit of paper in the window, but slightly enraged about the cost of it. Britain has 15 million motorists, all of whom, according to the RAC, are victims of a modern version of highway robbery. Highway robbery or not, when the disc makes way for the digital age, will it improve matters? The government's gone to great lengths to convince us that it will, claiming the removal of the paper trail will save taxpayers a cool 10 million. You know, we've had some great times. And the truth is, there is somebody else. Um, I've met somebody, somebody online. But there has been some criticism from motoring groups who say that people don't know enough about today's changes. For example, did you know that if you sell your car, you can't pass the tax disc on? The next owner has to buy a new one from scratch. And if you don't tell the DVLA straight away, you could face a £1,000 fine. There's also the question of evasion or error, with accusations that rather than saving money, it could cost the economy dear. 1% of AMPR checks aren't accurate. People might have a dirty number plate or the screws on the number plate might be too close to the numbers or the letters and all those things can actually distort the reading so there may be some small problems. Either way there's no turning back now. I'll never forget you. Bye. <laughs> Thomas reporting there. <laughs> Now, 70 years ago, British forces, along with allied countries, were stepping up their efforts against Germany in an attempt to bring an end to the Second World War. Indeed, at the time, hundreds of thousands of American troops and their families, of course, moved to the UK. Now, historians at the Imperial War Museum want our help to find out more about them and create an interactive archive. David Wood has more details. <laughs> They dropped their bombs. The Second World War saw fighting at sea and in the air, and that meant US troops flooded into makeshift bases across the UK to be closer to the conflict. And now historians want to make a permanent record of their involvement. People out there who maybe have individual memories of American servicemen, they've been amazed and wowed by these, by these airmen um, who looked like film stars and talked like film stars and, and were very, very exciting people to suddenly land in the middle of your village. Um, so we think there's an awful lot of people out there who, who really want to get involved with this history and tell their story um, and, and we want to give them a platform to do that. Alongside personal memories, photos and archive from the time is being used to get a sense of life on a US airbase. This photo in some ways exemplifies what is really exciting and interesting about what you can find on our website. This sort of serial number you can see in the background which identifies the aircraft. But actually, you can also use it to find out so many more interesting things. We don't actually know the identity of the three little girls at the front, but we do know that this was taken at a particular base. 
And it's the personal stories behind those photographs that historians want to find out more about. More than 30,000 US airmen flew from fields across the UK and lost their lives in the Second World War. And this website hopes to make sure their sacrifice is never forgotten. Hundreds are remembered in graveyards throughout the UK and the continent, but in some cases not even their names are known. And the website's curators say more people are becoming interested in military history. At the moment the First World War is very much in people's minds um, and it's really great to see people engaging with those sort of stories. The Second World War um, is perhaps taking a little bit more of a back seat at the moment but I think it's good for people to remember that many of the people of that generation are still with us and we need to be talking to them about their past. The website is now live, all to try and make sure that past is recorded well into the future. David Wood, ITV News. It's hard to believe it's October the 1st already, but it is, and that means there's plenty going on to celebrate Black History Month. Yes, in Southampton, they're marking 10 years of events and they've pulled out all the stops. Students at City College have been learning about the struggles and successes of multicultural communities. This afternoon, they kicked off four weeks of music, dance and exhibitions and Kerry Swain was there. Happy day! Celebrating the launch of the 10th Black History Month in Southampton, the choir of St George's Catholic School. The boys' performance earned a standing ovation from guests, leading figures in the black and white community. Black History Month started in America in 1926 and was first celebrated in the UK in 1987. Launched in Southampton a decade ago by this man, for me, it's kind of told people that black history is not just about slavery and racism. It's about uh, a group of people who have overcome adversity and have achieved a great deal despite that. Take ego out of cruelty. In modern day society, it does not belong. So why do we need racism if it's so wrong? Students at Southampton City College demonstrating black hairstyles through the ages. Organisers say even after 500 years of black people in Southampton, education is important. People ask me where I'm from, generally, when they meet me, and I'll say I'm from Southampton, because this is where I was born. And quite often they're very quizzical, a little frown comes along, and then I wonder, OK, do they really mean where are your parents from or what is your heritage? So Black History Month gives me my own unique little history, which is part Jamaican, part Southampton. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die, cause I don't know what's up there. Concerts, theatre productions and exhibitions are taking place across the city throughout the month. Kerry Swain, ITV News. Well, we have covered many events for Black History Month over the years, celebrations which have united communities and promoted greater understanding. Yes, in Brighton last year, communities celebrated with traditional Zimbabwean musical instruments, whilst in Southampton, school children, police officers and community leaders focused on the local contributions black people have and indeed are still making. Well, today's keynote speaker at the Southampton event was Lord Herman Oosley. He's chairman of the Kick It Out campaign, tackling racism in football. And he took some time to speak to me a little earlier. Lord Oosley, thank you so much for joining us. I'll start by asking you just how important Black History Month has been for our communities. Uh, Black History Month helps us to establish better community cohesion within our societies by ensuring that everyone has a, a true knowledge of what other communities can contribute, what they have contributed, uh, and building the confidence across all communities that can work and learn from each other about each other. Absolutely. It's certainly changed a bit over the years, hasn't it? What are the issues we should be focusing on at the moment and in the future? 
I think we need to build collaboration across all communities so they can all be proud of themselves, whether they're white, black, brown, male or female, poor communities. It's very important that people feel proud of what they've contributed, who they are, uh, and to get to know about each other. And the focus very much with regards to community cohesion is to enable people to share space, to communicate with each other, to know about each other, and to build stronger communities. And Lord Usley, do you think enough's being done in schools to educate young people? I think education is the key to everything. About the next generation, uh, a lot of the focus has to be on how we get children to learn about each other, learn about themselves, be proud of who they are, but to recognise the respect we need to have for each other is part of how we build a strong, uh, a strong community, a strong society, a strong nation that can go forward and be very proud of what, we are, what we've achieved as a diverse society here in the UK. Certainly. And finally, Lord Usley, you've been behind the Kick It Out campaign supported by so many of the football clubs in our region. Is that really making a difference? It's certainly making a difference because although complaints are on the increase uh, and largely a, an inf uh, a, a very big jump in anti-Semitic uh, incidents, uh, clearly the experience of playing and watching football is much better than it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago. And once again, education plays a part in helping the next generation of supporters and players uh, to, to, to realise that they can enjoy, have an experience of playing and watching in a way that's less harassed uh, and, 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 and without abuse in the future. Great, Lord Usley. We'll be following Black History Month as it progresses. Thanks so much for joining us today. OK, it's a pleasure. Now, one of the most popular children's films at the moment is, of course, Frozen. But back in the 70s, the railway children had a similar effect amongst younger audiences and made the name of an 18-year-old actress called Jenny Agatha. Now, one of the other stars of the film is being given a full makeover and restoration at a railway museum. Derek Proud has this report. Brushstroke after careful brushstroke, Ian Matthews is helping to restore one of the most legendary trains in film history. I really love the job, especially when it's a local like this, which has got a, a different history to it, rather than just a local off the main line or just an old museum piece. This has been in the film, so it just adds that little extra to it. Because this train behind me was the one that came within feet of killing Jenny Agatha. In the 1970s film, The Railway Children, you must remember the one where the landslide brought the trees crashing down the hillside in that rather weird way and blocking the line. Oh, it's moving. And then there was Jenny Agatha and her two friends frantically trying to stop the train by waving her red petticoat. They won't see us. It's all no good. Get off the line, Bobby. It's all no good. And all of the time, the train hurtling closer and closer. The loco itself was built round about the 1940s, but the film is set in the 1800s, and so they made it look far more Victorian by putting the extra lining on. The lettering, which Ian has repainted on the side of the engine, stands for the Great Northern and Southern Railway, a company invented for the film. And Richard found the exact brown colour by tracking down one of the original painters. I don't know why, but he must have had a garage full of tins of paint and he just had this recollection that he still had one and he eventually found this tin, which he was able to give us the details off, which gave us what we were looking for. The engine appeared in a very similar livery in the 1990s for the 20th anniversary of the film, but it was a, a very much simplified version of the livery. But we wanted to recreate it and put it back exactly as it was for the film, so that's took quite a lot of research. The fact that it's a film that you know you used to know and love as a child and you see regularly on the TV and to have this opportunity to do something with the loco that was in it, it just gives that little extra special touch to it really. Jenny Agatha would be proud of it. I hope so, yeah. Derek Proud, ITV News. Oh, wonderful. One of my favourites. I know. Fantastic. Now, many of us are yet to turn the heating on, but over the next few days, things are expected to cool down. Well, one family from Bournemouth have been given the shock of their life after finding something living in their boiler. Yes, curled up inside was this chap, a three-foot-long python. The snake turned out to be harmless and is probably an escaped pet. It's now being looked after by a local reptile pet shop and the search is on for the owner. Absolutely freaked out. Um, never imagined that could actually happen. 
there was that initial panic thinking, what if it goes for me? And I put my shoes on as well in case I bit my feet. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> so be careful what's in the boiler. Let's sneak our way into the weather now. Here she is, Lucy Verisami. That's us driving on, mm -hmm. us driving off in France, mm. and us on the bridge. Oh. Driving to Europe, Eurotunnel Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Hello to you again, a very good evening. Well, a fresher feel as we topple our way into a new month, a little different than the last few days. Staying mostly dry for the rest of the week, cloud coming and going. That's very much the theme we had today, as you can see from the earlier satellite and radar picture. Early morning cloud gave way to reveal brighter skies and sunshine. Uh, cloudier skies to end the day, the thickest cloud may be giving the odd spot of drizzle here and there before the evening is out. But on the whole, most of us are staying dry and come uh, tonight well little change cloud coming and going some misty low cloud developing in places and generally temperatures not falling too far but into tomorrow morning it could well be a grey misty sort of start to the new day and then things are set to improve through the afternoon spells of sunshine developing highs of 19 or 20 degrees and generally uh, just a touch fresher than it has felt of late, I think. Staying dry on Friday before the rain moves through on Saturday and then things improving again come Sunday. I'll see you again soon. Ah, oh. Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Next, there's a party political broadcast followed by the national and international news with Alistair Stewart and Mary Nightingale. Join Sarah for our late news, but for now from the team here at ITV Meridian, thanks so much for watching. Take good care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.